Welcome to EMS Office Hours. This is Jim Hoffman, and these are your Monday Minutes. Um, today, guys, we're going to continue on with those respiratory emergencies. This is actually part four, um, but it's part two of the obstructed airway diseases, mainly COPD and asthma. And we'll get into COPD more today, and we're going to talk a little bit about the general uh, causes and signs and symptoms and management of both COPD and asthma today as well, okay? So before I do, guys, I always like to say and remind you why this stuff is important. Now, of course, it's, it's for exams, but it's not just for exams, right? It's also made to build your knowledge base and make you a better clinician in the field to make you allow you to have better decisions when it comes to your patient care, with your report writing, and also when you interact with other healthcare professionals. So it all kind of ties in. And of course, my hope is that if you find something on these videos that you're not quite sure of and what not quite sure what it means on and you need more information that's going to encourage you and motivate you to go and look further in your textbook online and get some more information about this topic or even a specific area that you saw in this video. So again, we're gonna talk about COPD today, guys, and, and talk about what it means and pretty much what it is. It's a progressive, irreversible disease. Okay, it's marked by both an inspiratory and expiratory uh, decreased capacity of the lungs. So you're getting a decreased capacity on both ends. And it's usually a combination of both bronchitis and emphysema. So what causes it? What are some things you're going to see when it comes to your assessment with COPD? Well, you get that too much mucus in the airways, okay, is an overgrowth of the mucus glands in the airways, and that gives that excess mucus going on, okay, which is, of course, going to be an issue with them breathing. Emphysema in particular, that's that destruction of those elastic walls of the alveoli, okay, and they end up trapping air, okay, can sometimes eventually will end up popping, all right. The airway is going to have that mark resistance to air movement as well. Okay, you get the barrel chest type thing. And core pulmonal, that's when you're going to see things like right sided heart failure. And this is that effort of the, the, um, uh, that the heart's having. And it, it's more effort it's doing to get blood to, you know, the diseased lungs. Okay. Um, and then you've got a major cause, of course, of cigarette smoking. We all know that. And our CO2 retention, guys, okay, that's that patient. They've lost their CO2 drive to breathe, okay, and low oxygen, hypoxic is their only, you know, one that being their only drive to breathe, okay. So that it's kind of reversed in the normal person, all right. And this is kind of unusual, and this is why, you know, a lot of times you hear about not giving oxygen to COPD patients, but of course in the emergency setting, Oxygen is not going to be contraindicated in these types of patients. Okay, so they've lost their their CO two their CO two drive, um, in in um in, in breathing. Okay, and their CO two retention. Um, so what are some of the signs and symptoms here, guys? Well, we're talking. This is primarily for both. This is for both COPD and asthma. It's not just for COPD. But we're talking about pa patients that will be able to only speak to you in one or two word sentences, right? They'll be coughing a lot. Um, they're going to be uh, tachycardic, maybe even hypertensive. They'll be tachypnic, meaning they're breathing very, very fast. Uh, you'll see accessory muscle use on these patients. You'll get the barrel-chested patients, okay? Those, of course, are the ones that are the air trapping, right? The barrel-chested type patients. And you're going to have audible breath sounds many, many times, these types of patients. You're going to hear the wheezing without even having to use your stethoscope, okay? And you're going to have the low SpO2 two readings as well, okay? And, of course, that's going to be indicating on how aggressive you're going to be. Um, and when you talk about things like intubation and stuff like that, you might see JVD as well on patients, especially with the ones with the right side of heart failure, okay, um, and lower extremity edema as well. Now, some stuff, guys, that I want to point out to you here and looking for when you look at signs and symptoms that might be an indication for the patient to be more of priority type patients, and those are the patients that have, a, you know, a, a cyano who are cyanotic, um, they're very, very anxious, they're getting... Uh, feeling like they're suffocating, like they're getting too tired to be able to breathe anymore. Patients that have an altered level of consciousness, 
uh, and also patients that are diaphoretic or uh, you know cool pale okay um, those patients you want to start thinking about them being um, more uh, of the priority sort of end of the spectrum okay we're well, going to think about transporting more rapidly for those patients yeah i spelled diaphoretic wrong here so sorry about that so i want to finish up here guys and talk about some of the management of copd um these patients uh, for me are some of my favorite patients because it's pretty clear cut what you're going to be doing with them and that's managing their airway even up to intubation and that's going to depend upon your protocols and what you can do and of course what your uh, abilities are in the field and what you have accessible to you, right? But most of the time with the intubation, especially when they're getting altered mental status where they, they can't breathe, where they feel they can't breathe, where the SpO2 is very low, it's in the 70s or low 80s, right? Um, you're gonna give them oxygen, of course, as the first line, usually non-rebreather or nasocranial if they can't tolerate that. And of course, that depends upon your protocol as well. Uh, we're going to move into our nebulizer as soon as we can as well, guys. Most of these patients will respond somewhat to albuterol, especially if we get them early on. But there are other drugs you can use as well. You can use Comivent nebulizer treatments. You can use uh, things like Cytomedrol or Max Sulfate or Epinephrine. Um, you know, that's usually Epinephrine IM. Um, and again, those are all going to depend upon your protocols and what you're allowed to do within your system, okay? And guys, listen, you transport these patients, they're not going to want to lay down, so make sure you transport them sitting upright. Don't let them exert themselves, okay? Carry them to the stretcher, carry them to the ambulance. You don't want them exerting themselves and, and increasing the assurance of breath even, even more. Of course, you'll get an IV. If you needed to administer any drugs or for any other reason, you might need to get an IV access. And you're going to want to monitor these patients, guys, monitor the vital signs. And that includes their mental status. That includes their oxygen saturation as well. Do an EKG to these patients too, guys, because a lot of times patients, especially ones that are, that are older, that have COPD, things like that, there might be something else going on, and you don't want to miss something else that might be happening with these patients, especially if you're going to be giving drugs to them like cellumedrol, sulfate, and epi. You don't want to go ahead and, and miss something on on. Uh, you know, on a patient by not doing a simple EKG. No one said you have to do a 12 lead unless they're having chest pain unless you suspect some sort of cardiac event going on. But doing EKG can really help you um, with that and, and kind of do a full, help you complete that full assessment with that patient. All right, guys, that's it for me. I hope you found these minutes uh, helpful. Okay, sorry about some of the misspellings on the slides. Um, I proofread them as much as I can, but I guess once in a while I miss a few things. Um, but be sure to engage with me, guys. Get me on uh, Twitter or on Instagram. I'm at EMS Safe on both of those channels. Um, I do a lot of interesting stuff on Instagram, uh, not just EMS related. I just kind of do some funny stuff and some educational stuff and things like that. So I hope you'll join me there. I'm at EMS Safe on those channels. And of course, you can also get me on Facebook. I am. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash the EMS professional on Facebook as well. And of course, you can always contact me via email, and that's contact at EMSOfficeHours.com. Guys, I hope that you'll go check out my main website at EMSSEO.com. And that's going to offer you lots of stuff like practice exams. Um, we have a, an exam system there called the NRE SIM, and that kind of simulates the National Registry exam where it'll turn off or turn on based on how many questions you get right or wrong, kind of helping simulate that a little bit. Um, we've got things like study guides there, videos, audios, and things, other, many, many other uh, content available to you to help increase your knowledge base there as well. Um, guys, go check that out when you get a chance if you're looking for some help on, on exams or if you're just looking to help build your knowledge base, which is what I always encourage all EMS professionals to, to be doing, okay? Um, so that's it, guys. Uh, like I said, any questions, comments, you have some suggestions for the show, be sure to contact me. You can reply to this video in the comments below. You can message me on Facebook, message me and direct message me on Instagram, um, or you can contact me via email. And again, that contact is contact at emsofficehours.com. All right, guys, that's it for me and the Monday Minutes. Until next time, as always, I am Jim Hoffman for EMS Office Hours. Stay safe.